Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Decolonizing Justice. I'm Liz Keith. I'm the program director with Pro Bono Net, and we are delighted to have everyone with us this afternoon. Um, as mentioned this morning, this event has a language justice focus. So before we begin, I would like to um, introduce our interpreters from Cooperativa Brujulas, an organization based in Puerto Rico and dedicated to language justice and healing to tell us about the interpretation logistics for those who prefer to participate in Spanish. Our uh, opening keynote will be available in interpretation and then we will uh, transition to the, the panel, uh, which will just be in English. So um, I'll turn it over to our in, uh, interpretation colleagues. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. My name is Bruje Fuego and I'm part of Cooperativa Brujulas, joined here with my colleague Millo doing translation on the chat. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Bruje Fuego, estoy aquí como parte de Cooperativa Brujulas con mi colega Millo haciendo traducción del chat. Brevemente les queremos mencionar que pueden activar su función de interpretación para escuchar la interpretación de este evento al español. Pueden ver la función como un globo abajo en su pantalla, en la parte baja de su pantalla, y ahí la pueden activar. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for inviting us to be part of making sure that language justice is included in this series of events for this week. And we'll see you in interpretation. Les vemos en la interpretación. Gracias. Great. Thank you so much, Bruje and Mio. And again, welcome, everybody. Um, we are delighted to be beginning our second uh, session and discussion in this week's gathering. And uh, this session is called esta Transform. Esta reunión, esta sesión se llama Transformando. Uh, this uh, session this afternoon is called Transforming Legal Aid to Achieve People-Centered Justice. And again, uh, we invite you to share your feedback and your observations and questions through the chat and Q&A boxes in Zoom. And also to use the Decolonizing Justice Slack space to connect with one another and continue these conversations throughout this event. Um, if you have concerns or questions or need technical support at any time, don't hesitate to contact our event facilitator, Jenny Rose Halperin, um, whose email address we will share in a moment. So uh, I'm now very pleased to turn um, the introduction to our next session over to Nicole Nelson, a member of the steering committee for this, this week's gathering and the executive director of Alaska Legal Services Corporation. Thanks, Liz. Um, again, so I'm Nicole Nelson, and I am the executive director of Alaska Legal Services, which is a nonprofit legal aid law firm that provides comprehensive uh, civil legal assistance to low-income people, marginalized people in Alaska. Um, we are an LSC, a Legal Services Corporation funded program. Um, and today, my pronoun, today I am coming to you from Anchorage, Alaska, which is also the traditional and contemporary homelands of the Dene'ina people. Um, and my pronouns are her and she. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the way that legal aid organizations, which we know have long played a role in a very important role in advocating for greater access to justice. And this session is going to focus on the ways in which um, legal aid lawyers and providers can work in community with others to elevate and advance calls for more people centered and less lawyer forward um, models of justice. And we're also going to talk about what happens when, as sometimes is the case, when we lawyers, legal aid lawyers, frame the access to justice problem solely as that marginalized people, that's black, indigenous people of color and low income people um, don't have access to lawyers. And when we frame the question just as that, it ends up directing us to one solution, just one solution, which is more lawyers. Um, and that accepts a system that is fundamentally unfair, perhaps whether you have a lawyer or not. And so I wanted to, I'm hoping today that we'll explore um, the ways in which if we started framing the problem a little bit differently, one around our justice system design is the design of our justice system um, 
requires um, a lawyer and most people don't have them. And that it, the design of our justice system, um, there's a lack of inclusivity from the people most impacted by the system in its design. And if we thought about the problem in that way, we might see start to see a wider range of solutions um, on access to justice issues. So we're going to start off with a keynote today. I'm very pleased to um, uh, introduce Jim Sandman. Jim Sandman is the president emeritus of the Legal Services Corporation, which is the largest funder of civil legal aid in the U.S. Um, Prior to uh, being the, the president emeritus, he was the longest service, serving uh, president of LSC, and I've had the great good fortune of working with Jim for many, many years. Um, and prior to that, uh, Jim also was in private practice uh, for large international law firms and also was a general counsel of the DC public schools. Um, he continues his work today um, as a distinguished uh, lecturer at for the future of the profession at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and is a chair of the ABA, as, the ABA Association's Task Force on Legal Needs Arising Out of the Pandemic. And in my mind, um, there really is no one better suited to kick off this conversation. Um, Jim has spent his legal career thinking about learning and advocating for a more just world through the legal system and the legal profession. And, figuring out ways to better um, the U.S. civil legal aid delivery system. So um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jim. Jim, you're let's see, you're muted. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Sandman. My pronouns are he and him. And if you hang on a minute, I will be ready to get started. I'd like to start this afternoon with three propositions. First, law belongs to the people. Law does not belong to the lawyers. Law allows the assertion and the protection of individual rights and liberties. Second, law particularly the civil justice system, is failing the people by many measures and has failed the people for decades. This failure has profound implications for racial justice, or should I say, racial injustice. Third, it is time for a revolution, for solutions that are finally commensurate with the magnitude and the urgency of the problem. It is time to recognize that the twin vehicles at the forefront of addressing the problem for decades, legal aid and pro bono services, are insufficient by themselves. It is time to recognize that the people need to be mobilized and empowered to participate directly, not through lawyers, in the reform of a legal system that belongs to them. I'm reminded of the words of a hero and a friend of mine, Patty Mulehu Fougere, who for many years has been executive director of the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. Patty bristles when anyone suggests that the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless is a voice for the voiceless. What she says is our clients have a voice. Our job is to give them a platform and an amplifier. I'd like to start off with a few examples of the magnitude of the failure of the current system to serve the people. These figures are likely well known to you, but I do think it's important to start off with them. The Legal Services Corporation's Justice Gap study in 2017 found that 86% of the civil legal needs of low-income people either get no help or inadequate help. The study found that among people had, who had approached LSC-funded legal aid programs over a six-week period in early 2017, eligible people, 42% of them got turned away with no help of any kind, zero. 
That portion of the survey was repeated a year later in 2018. And notwithstanding an increase in funding, the percentage of people, eligible people, turned away with no help of any kind had ticked up another percentage point. Then there's the work of Rebecca Sandifer, now at, the, at Arizona State University. Her research has shown consistently that one of the most important reasons people don't get legal help is that they don't self-identify their problem as a legal problem. They never get near legal aid. We need to figure out why that is and address it. Most distressingly to me are the numbers on unrepresented litigants in the courts of the United States today. The National Center for State Courts estimates that in 76% of civil cases in state courts, at least one of the parties does not have a lawyer. And that number, 76%, does not include family law cases. If it did, the percentage would be even higher. I recently started a new career teaching law students. And what I tell them is that every case they read in law school is unrepresentative of what actually happens in the majority of cases in the courts of the United States today. I'd hazard an educated guess that every case they read in law school was litigated with lawyers on both sides. Otherwise, it's unlikely that the judge would have been able to write an opinion of the quality necessary to find its way into a case book. The notion of an adversary system, lawyer against lawyer, is a fiction today. Those who cannot afford lawyers or don't have access to lawyers for whatever reason are disproportionately people of color. There is a strong correlation between income inequality and race. Look at the people in the high volume courtrooms with large numbers of unrepresented litigants. Matthew Desmond's eviction lab estimates that between 2010 and 2015, landlords filed eviction cases against black renters at twice the rent rate of eviction filings against white tenants. The unrepresented litigant faces a legal system created by lawyers for lawyers, by the privileged for the privileged. Everything about the system, from the language of the law, to the forms that are used, to the rules of civil procedure, to the rules of evidence, all of it was created with lawyers in mind. It's a system that works pretty well if you have a lawyer, and horribly if you don't. I recently participated in a hearing before a California State Bar uh, working group on developing a paraprofessional system in California exploring whether California should begin to license paralegals to do things that are currently considered the unauthorized practice of law. There were a couple of witnesses from the public. One of them told the story of walking into a clerk's office in a courthouse, only to see a big sign saying, we cannot give legal advice. What a welcome mat. So what is to be done? I want to make four suggestions this afternoon. First, we need to take a lesson from two very wise people, Brian Stevenson and Edgar Kahn. Brian Stevenson emphasizes the critical importance of being proximate, as he puts it, proximate to a problem. And he means physically proximate not figuratively proximate. He's talking about going to and being with the client, with the people where they are. Edgar Kahn's master plan for the modern legal system was articulated in an article that he and his wife Jean published in the Yale Law Journal in 1964 entitled, The War on Poverty, A Civilian Perspective. The article envisioned true neighborhood law firms that would help empower what he called indigenous leadership. It was Edgar and Jean Kahn's article that caused Sergeant Schreiber to include a legal services program in the war on poverty. And that led to the first federal funding for legal aid, which in turn led to the creation of the Legal Services Corporation. The lesson to me is that at least 
post COVID, we need to embrace the neighborhood model once again, to practice proximity in the location of offices, to embed lawyers in community organizations that are physically proximate to clients, and to think about where we live. Second, we need to do a much better job of including the people in the leadership, design, and delivery of legal services. I'll give you three examples of what I mean. Since the 1970s, Congress has required that at least one third of the members of the boards of legal services organizations funded by the Legal Services Corporation be clients. But I know that over the nine years that I was at LSC, it was a perennial problem for many grantees to fill the client seats. Last year, in fact, at the request of grantees, LSC loosened the eligibility regulations for client board members to make it easier to fill the client seats. Many of the client board members have served multiple terms, many multiple terms, not infrequently for decades, in part because of the difficulty of finding new board members to replace them. I think these problems in filling seats are a symptom of a lack of proximity. We have to try harder. We must do better. The people are entitled to one third of the seats and there should be a waiting list of people eager to fill them. A second example, the community legal needs studies that LSE requires often base needs assessments on surveys of clients or of other organizations. They don't reach the people Rebecca Sandifer's research identifies as a huge source of unmet legal needs. People who don't self-identify their problem as a legal problem and therefore never become legal aid clients. We need to find ways to reach people who don't find us, to include them, and to recognize that if they are not in our community needs surveys, if their views are not reflected in community needs surveys, we are reaching only a fraction of the community we're trying to serve. Finally, service delivery systems need to be designed, evaluated, and improved using principles of user-centered design. The users are the people. The people need to drive and be at the very center of the process not play roles simply as consultants or as testers at the end of a lawyer-driven process. My third major suggestion is that we need to reform antiquated restrictions on the unauthorized practice of law and permit licensed, regulated, trained professionals who are not lawyers to provide legal services. The evidence is to me irrefutable that the people need more helpers. In the ostensible interest of protecting the people from incompetent and unscrupulous actors, we have in our wisdom consigned those who can't get a lawyer to getting no help from anyone. We've let the perfect become the enemy of the good. I've heard the objections to creating new categories of licenses, licensees, to provide legal services. I've heard the objection that this will result in a two-tiered system of justice where rich people get what's called a real lawyer and poor people get what is derisively called half a lawyer. I think it is the height of lawyer elitism, of lawyer privilege, to suggest that no one who lacks a law degree and attorney membership in a bar could be smart enough or competent enough or ethical enough to provide useful legal assistance under an appropriate regulatory system. And if you disagree, I say, let's hear directly from the people about what they think and not presume to speak for them. When regulatory reforms to improve access to justice were recently put out for public comment in Utah, Arizona, and California, 
there was a sharp divergence of sentiment between lawyers and the public. In Utah, 71% of the commenting lawyers were opposed to change, but 60% of the commenting public approved. In Arizona, 93% of the commenting lawyers were opposed. 67% of the commenting public approved. In a California survey about allowing non-lawyers to provide legal services, 94% of the responding lawyers were opposed, 70% of the public responding were in favor. We need to open the lawyer regulatory process to true public participation and stop meeting in the private councils of the bar in places that are not accessible to the public and publicized in ways that the public will never see or hear of. My final recommendation is that we need to simplify court processes with people at the center. We need in particular to focus on high stakes, high volume cases where huge numbers of people unrepresented are unrepresented to make it possible for self-represented litigants to get a fair shot. We need a complete redo driven by user-centered design principles with strong public participation. We need to recognize that the majority of the users of our legal system today are not lawyers. This should not be rocket science. More than 50 years ago, the United States put two people on the moon. If we could do that, we can surely simplify the legal system to address the realities of today and to resolve the failures in the system in serving the people. This is a challenge because of our system of federalism where the legal matters that affect low-income people most tend to be matters of state law. So you face the prospect of having to do things 50 times over. But I think it is nevertheless possible to develop templates that could be adapted across the 50 states and not require each state to do this independently. One observer of our legal system put it this way. He said, we need to make law less complex and more workable. He said, lawyers have been paid and paid well to proliferate subtleties and complexities. It's about time we brought our intellectual resources to bear on eliminating some of those intricacies. The speaker was Attorney General Robert Kennedy. On May 1st, 1964, Law Day, in a speech at the University of Chicago Law School. I think what he said then is even more true today. I would disagree with him in one respect. I don't think that that process of simplifying should be the sole province of lawyers. Yes, there's a role for lawyers to play, but that process needs to be driven by the people. The law belongs to the people, not to lawyers. The law is failing the people. It's time for a revolution. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jim. I feel like I'm, I'm ready to join the revolution with you. And um, I, I want to say, um, you know, so many uh, things that you said today really resonated with me. Um, with such powerful words, your call to a revolution is amazing. And also, you know, coming from an organization where we are spread across a vast territory, I'm always very mindful of the idea of proximity to the problems and our, that um, our clients and our communities are facing and um, have long been of the mind that boots on the ground matter in understanding and living the, it within the community that you are serving is, is very, important and essential. So thank you so much for that. And I would like to um, now transition to a moderated panel. We've got some other really fantastic folks here who are going to, um, you know, fill out this conversation. Jim, I hope you will stick around and join us. And we will also, for those of you in the audience, we'll be taking questions. And so please put those into the, to the chat or the Q&A and we'll be pausing briefly to take questions as we, as we move on. Um, 
Okay, so as we move to our panel, I want to um, just briefly introduce, um, we've got um, three wonderful panelists who come with a wide variety of experiences um, through various legal aid programs, um, some of which have been LSE funded, and also sort of justice system, other uh, innovative um, projects related to um, helping people access justice in, in a different way. And I hope through this conversation, we can talk about um, some of these really great ideas that Jim has been urging us to take action on. Um, so first up, we have uh, Marika Diaz, who is, the, who is with the Urban Justice Center. And Marika has, um, she is a public interest lawyer who has had a great deal of experience working in a wide variety of settings. She currently works for the Urban Justice Center and previously worked for Make the Road New York. And after, and in between those two, um, with a legal aid program in New York City. And that, I think, gave Marika a really um, wide range of experience in a number of differing approaches to legal aid and lawyering in resolving systemic access to justice issues. So Marika, if I could just ask you to start us off, can you tell us a bit about yourself, uh, your, your current work, and also the organization Make the Road New York that you used to work for, and what roles the lawyers played in, in those organizations? Oh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's good to be here with you all. Um, yeah, my name is Marika Diaz, and I, I use gender pronouns she and her, and I'm speaking to you from Lenape land in the South Bronx. Um, and, you know, yeah, I, I you know, it, I've worked in a, in a, as Nicole was saying, a range of different civil legal services contexts. Um, for me, you know, the work that I've pursued um, you know, throughout my time working as an attorney, and actually even before I was an attorney, but working in legal services orgs, was really, you know, how do we do legal services work, um, including direct legal services work, in a way that supports grassroots community organising around issues, um, organising that's happening by and for directly impacted communities. Um, and so, you know, what that's led me to is working on a range of different projects and in different orgs where I've sort of worked closely in partnership with community organisers um, and, and organisers who are working with folks who are impacted by issues and who are trying to come together collectively to change systems, to fight back against whatever it is they're grappling with. Um, and so, you know, in the context of, um, you know, my current role, the work that we do is, is around tenant rights issues, um, um, access to public benefits and and issues you know that are um, that folks who are homeless are grappling with, um, and we have a membership base of folks who are either currently or formerly homeless who are the safety net activists who actually guide and lead our, um, our efforts in that area, um, both in terms of the organizing campaigns that we get involved in, but also in terms of th our thinking around what are the direct services that people need and, and what are we going to be offering and kind of, you know, what needs are we responding to and so forth. Um, you know, my prior role, I was actually at Legal Services NYC directing a very large um, citywide tenant rights coalition. And there, you know, the approach was a bit different. It was, it was one where we very much partnered with, with tenant organizing groups who were working with tenants in buildings. And, you know, we provided the, the legal support that those folks needed to embark on whatever struggles they were, were facing. And, you know, the things that they were doing were not all legal, right? The legal component that we were bringing to the table was but one of the various strategies that they were utilizing and other things involved direct action and rallies and media and, you know, like a range of different things that people were kind of you know, seeing their problems, looking at how they were going to address them and seeing the law as but one tool in the, in the overall toolkit that they had. Um, and that was the piece that we would bring to the table. Um, and then, you know, at an organization like Make the Road, it, it's yet again a different model. There, it's a, it's a group that, um, you know, is focused on grassroots organizing. That's really the raison d'etre of the, of the organization. 
and the legal services is there in support of that, um, which can include, you know, direct survival services, um, you know, working with folks who are individuals so that they can actually grapple with the, the things that they need to grapple with so that they can participate in the organising, so that they can participate in, in democratic institutions and so forth. Um, and then also, you know, democratising legal information, right? Know your rights trainings, kind of sharing information about the law in, in, in modes that are actually accessible to people, um, which includes language access, which includes disability access, includes, you know, making things kind of something that people can actually, um, you know, uh, there's actually available to people. Um, and then finally, kind of really supporting on the policy side, right? Like as, as lawyers, we bring a lot of skill and expertise in kind of how systems of power and oppression work in terms of how, you know, the halls of power work. Um, you know, we have access to things that oftentimes other folks don't have, and we can contribute a lot to campaigns, not in the leadership of developing the solutions, because, you know, we believe that the, the folks who are closest to the problems are the ones that are closest to the solutions, but rather in bringing out technical expertise to bear on whatever solutions they're trying to pursue. Um, and so that's really kind of, for me, has been, you know, sort of run the gamut of, of the types of ways that I've worked as an attorney um, in supporting kind of movements developing. That's fantastic, Marika. Thank you for sharing that with us. I had a question. I understand that in recent years, you've been part of a tenant-led coalition that won a right to counsel in eviction cases. And what approaches to the work um, did the Right to Counsel Coalition seek from legal aid lawyers to make that Right to Counsel transformative? What were the ten What is the Tenants Coalition looking for out of our justice system? Well, you know, I, it's it's a good question because, interestingly, and it speaks a little bit to to what James was talking about. You know, when tenants were fighting for a right to counsel in New York City. I think the, the thing that is important to, to highlight is that they were doing that not necessarily with the belief that, that just having lawyers was going to solve all of their problems in housing court um, or to be the way to fight back against gentrification more broadly, but rather, I think, coming from a perspective of, you know, housing court is a place that really because 95% plus of tenants didn't have lawyers and the same percentage of landlords did, landlords have been able to weaponize this space, have been able to utilize this space and really influence everything that happens in that space um, over the years and, and basically create a, you know, a home ground advantage for themselves and, and really um, everything from how the judges were adjudicating cases to how the clerk's office function, to how the hallways look, the physical setup, everything. And so tenants really, I think, came at it from a perspective of like, honestly, we don't think lawyers are going to solve all the problems. We don't believe that, that this is a, a just system as such, yet we need lawyers to have a fighting chance to be able to stay in our homes so that we can then go on and fight the next battles, right? And so when they're looking at now, like we're in this, you know, sort of period of phasing in the right to counsel in New York City, and we, you know, went from a place of as I said, less than 5% of tenants having lawyers to, you know, um, you know, hopefully eventually getting to a place where, you know, even 100% of tenants have lawyers and we're sort of partway along that road. Um, you know, what, what tenants are really looking for in their attorneys are folks who will, um, A, you know, that accessibility is, is key. Right. And, you know, we've really tried to work hard to make sure that people have access to right to counsel at every possible turn. Um, B, that, that will democratise legal knowledge, um, that are willing to cede some power, the power that we as a profession have, like, over the course of many, many, you know, centuries really have cultivated, um, you know, to, to be able to cede some of that power, to be working with people in a way that it builds solidarity. Um, but also to be pushing back against the systems, right? Like we participated actively, I myself actively over the years participated in the development of these systems that, that really disadvantaged tenants in many ways, right? Even those of us on the defense side um, were active participants in a, in a system that was really broken and, and, and messed up. And so now kind of doing the work to push back on things that exclude tenants, that disadvantage tenants. You know, we've put in place systems where tenants actually have input into how the right to counsel is being rolled out. 
um, and have a seat at that table to be able to really influence that. Um, and, and really honestly to push back against things that we ourselves have accepted over many years, like the idea of merit-based assessment and triage, right? Like, and the idea that there are some tenants who are deserving of lawyers versus others who are not deserving of lawyers. That was a big one in our profession, honestly. It would require a cultural shift because the nature of legal services is such that people had really internalized this idea of triage. Um, but, but the way it translates to tenants is, you know, depending on what the law says about your type of housing and your rights vis-a-vis -vis that housing, you may or may not merit my time as an attorney, right? And, and, and so that was a really a, a problem and a cultural shift that we've had to make. And there are many others, honestly, that, that the right to counsel, you know, ha has led to, but those are, those are just a few. That's really interesting. And I, I love the idea of, um, you know, having a tenant led or a community led, if you think it in different areas, um, leading, you know, directing lawyers in how we would go about triaging cases or how we, you know, what people might hope for um, out of the legal system that we have. So I really appreciate your, your insight on that. And I think that's a good segue to our next panelist, which is uh, Viviana Gordon, who is with the Red Hook Justice Center. And I'm hoping Viviana will tell us a bit about the Red Hook Justice Center. But one thing um, I should mention, and I think this sort of, I think Viviana's, um, uh, you know, Viviana can speak to a little bit, both about the idea of proximity um, which is something that Jim had mentioned before, the necessity of proximity to the problem, and also raising up these issues about how we um, involve those most impacted by our laws and our systems in resolving disputes themselves. So Viviana, you come to this panel with a very unique perspective. First off, I'll say you're not a lawyer and you are not part of a legal aid organization. Um, your work supports a justice center that is embedded within the community it serves and where those living within the community help others resolve Solve their disputes without lawyers. And so can you just, you know, tell our audience a bit more about this unique project and how it works? Yes, thank you, Nicole. And definitely, I think that the keynote, um, Jim's keynote gave so many <laughs> the concepts that we hold really dear with, you know, proximity to community and like, you know, really driving a user-centered experience really resonate with us. Um, I'm coming to you from also Lenape land in Red Hook, Brooklyn, and uh, my pronouns are she and her and hers. As the deputy director of the Reddit Community Justice Center, where I've worked uh, for the past 12 years, I'm a part of a pretty unique project that you mentioned. So we are a community court in Brooklyn that is a real courthouse um, that has a geographical jurisdiction over um, a handful of neighborhoods in Southwest Brooklyn. And we are also a multi-jurisdictional court. So even though we only have one judge and one courtroom, we hear cases in criminal, family, and housing court. Um, and I think today I'm definitely gonna focus a lot more on our housing court civil practice. Um, so in this courthouse, if you can envision it, oh, is also really a hub of community services. And I work for a nonprofit actually for the Center for for court innovation that works in partnership with the New York State court system to develop kind of new and innovative models of justice. And, you know, Center for Court Innovation, CCI, uses like an action research model, um, but also has a lot of uh, real New York City-based projects. And we've been working in Red Hook since the mid-90s, um, and the court opened in the year 2000. So let's see. Our housing court has is pretty unique. You know, in New York City, there are uh, five counties, five boroughs, and there's five large centralized housing courts. And then we are a housing court that is actually exclusively dedicated to the Red Hook public housing community. Um, so it's a small neighborhood. Um, Red Hook is a community with about 11,000 people. 7,000 live in New York City housing. Um, the Red Hook houses are the biggest public housing development in Brooklyn and one of the oldest in the city, 1938. We're talking about a really old plant. And if anybody reads the news, you know, NYCHA is just notorious um, as the worst landlord in New York City. And unfortunately, like the three decades now of disinvestment and underfunding and mismanagement uh, on top of this aged, uh, this, you know, this aged housing development, we see really horrific um, repairs. So we are based within the community. 
the court is within the community, and we have actually two help desk locations, one that is uh, attached to the court um, in non-COVID times. It's next to the clerk's office. We've actually been um, working remotely, obviously, since March, and exclusively based in our neighborhood office, which fortunately have, which is actually in a New York City Housing Authority apartment, literally within the houses. And as soon as we were able to get that up and running this summer, we did, even um, with housing courts largely closed, like the importance of our work has continued. So aside from the physical proximity, um, part of our model is also hiring from within the community. So of our five help desk staff members, four are lifelong residents of the Red Hook houses. We also are super grateful to welcome every year to our team an infusion of AmeriCorps members. Um, we oversee an AmeriCorps program that really helps us, um, we'll, we'll have seven this year working with housing, but uh, train and empower community residents to do so much of what um, uh, the keynote Jim was describing as far as democratizing legal information and just creating a bigger bridge of access to justice to the system. And we've had some real concrete impacts. And I wanted to share a few of the impacts to hopefully um, show what that proximity can yield. One of them, and you know, Marika mentioned this, how uh, housing court is really looked at as the landlord's home court. And there's very little tenant power in housing court. And unfortunately, in Red Hook, we are still among one of the zip codes that has not yet gotten uh, the universal uh, legal um, representation. So still about 97% of our tenants in housing court are pro se. Um, that being said, we've done a lot over the last few years to try to build tenant power in housing court and build access to justice. Um, we also have a huge presence and scope within the community. We actually worked with 43% of uh, households within the Red Hook houses. So nearly half, nearly half the Red Hook houses last year. And our housing court docket, um, while I believe in downtown Brooklyn, only about 7% of cases are tenant initiated. In Red Hook, it's regularly between 30 and 40% of tenants actually suing NYCHA for repairs, taking their landlord to court. And we've created that accessibility um, through just operating a help desk, so much community outreach, being a presence, being really embedded in the community, demystifying the process, all of that legal paperwork, um, which, you know, to file an HP action is actually a lot of pages. Um, you know, we provide a lot of assistance um, hands on, whether it's with the HP action paperwork or responding to other um, petitions and notices and claims, all of which are supposed to be able to be done pro se, but are really challenging. And so, you know, our staff and uh, AmeriCorps members um, assist with that legal paperwork. And we're really proud of the tenant um, power that we've generated in um, driving up uh, response to repairs. I did just see a question, so I'll respond to it, that um, another big issue is language access. Um, in Red Hook, there's a lot of non-English speaking households, um, Spanish, Chinese, Mandarin and Cantonese, and even Polish and Russian. And our local property management offices actually don't even have um, language access. So a lot of the systems that um, are supposed to also be uh, self-service and initiated um, are not accessible to non-English speakers. And, you know, we have bilingual staff in several languages and we also use an interpretation service. Um, but one thing that we've actually been able to do to increase um, proportionately know that we're reaching people that would usually have uh, language barriers to access was something that we started about five years ago. And for any um, anybody on this call who has public housing within your jurisdiction, there's a HUD requirement for annual lease recertifications. Um, and this is a pretty burdensome process on public housing tenants. Um, and the process moved online a few years ago. We first inserted ourselves in that space to bridge the technology barrier, but then we started discovering embedded within that system was so many ways that we could be ensuring um, maximum affordability and correct calculation of the legal rent. And there were a lot of uh, deductions and benefits out there that are you know, in the law from HUD 
that are not accessible and are not taken advantage of. And so we widely started promoting uh, that we help with those process, with the lease recertification process. And in doing so, we've actually seen a reduction in um, non-payment filings um, because rent was being unfairly calculated and also holdover proceeding filings when, you know, tenants didn't know how to, you know, uh, use the system to make adjustments and ensure that they were protected. Um, so I have other impacts I could share. I don't know. How am I doing on time? You're doing fantastic on time. I have okay. a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, and one thing I want to mention to folks that if you have questions, go ahead and throw them up in the chat. We'll be pausing um, in between um, after our next panelist and we will get, have an opportunity to ask questions of any of our panelists. So throw them up in the chat and we will get to them. Um, but one thing, so first off, I'm super, like I'm amazed by this idea that 30 to 40% of um, our tenant initiated lawsuits, I think those are things that you know, we would strive for in any, those are just amazing numbers, I think. Can you talk about what default rates um, are? Oh, yeah. It? Thank yeah. you. So that's another really good <laughs> benefit of both our proximity, but also I think just the, um, the firsthand knowledge that our judge and practicing court attorneys and, you know, the system players we work with um, have kind of the accountability that is generated by being based within the community. So we know, and actually we know from Matthew Desmond's work also, um, that default judgments are a huge either driver or precursor to eviction proceedings. And we, we knew that we could do a lot to prevent that. And so we've developed a lot of court attendance strategies. Um, everything from creating a welcoming court environment that's child friendly, that's senior friendly. Um, we provide breakfast snacks on housing court days to both parties to kind of prevent that, that hangry <laughs> feeling. And we know that people are running around juggling a lot of different um, appointments, a lot of times taking time off work too. So when the judge um, selects uh, future court dates, adjournment dates, he actually also does that in conjunction with uh, the tenant. You know, we're there five days a week. Any day is fine with us. Um, and it's really important to us that we pick a day that's convenient for people that also doesn't mean um, they have to take off work or have childcare issues. And um, it also just communicates that dignity and respect of recognizing that people are balancing many different things. So one of the things our AmeriCorps members do is also um, court reminder calls, attendance calls. So between court dates, we will reach out multiple times to check in about you know, the status of repairs. Have they been completed in the order that they were supposed to um, for any other assistance? And then court reminder calls. Um, and we also don't, I, I don't know if this practice has changed, Marika can probably speak to it, um, but I know in uh, other uh, New York City housing courts, a lot of times the, the court call time will be 9 or 9.30 in the morning and they'll begin uh, calling defaults only maybe one or two hours later, still usually in the, in the morning. And we um, won't call for defaults until the end of the day and uh, often will, if we can communicate with the tenant during the day and something has come up, a crisis or anything, we can often get an adjournment for them and not issue a default. Um, judgment. So the rate has actually been, um, while I believe in Brooklyn, based on Kings County Housing Court, 14% of cases result in default judgments. Last year, only 1% of our cases resulted in default judgment. So we have seen an, an impact there. And, and generally, we are just, um, you know, the concept of being embedded in, in community and, you know, recognizing that a lot of people don't view uh, the legalness of issues or challenges or stresses that they're feeling, um, that accessibility, the fact that our judge, court attorney, all of our housing staff are really widely known, their cell phone numbers are out there, um, I think really has made uh, it a more humane process. And what do you think, you know, one question I have about, um, what impact do you think it has on the decision maker, their proximity to the actual location and the, the, the community in which they're resolving problems? Mm. I mean, that's, the, that's the underlying concept of you know, uh, being a community court. And I think that you know, the fact that our, our legal systems have been predicated, um, Jim alluded to this, 
you know, on uh, systems of, of oppression and, and white supremacy and dehumanization. Um, and a lot of times just looking at people for their, their legal needs, their court charges in criminal court or docket numbers, um, being in community and understanding uh, just the full, the full spectrum in any neighborhood um, has really, I think, opened up the, the creativity um, within both our housing and criminal court practice and really uh, has also generated a lot more responses to the underlying issues and challenges that people are dealing with. You know, um, we have so many co-located services on site available to court defendants, litigants, and the community at large, a mental health clinic, um, a restorative justice mediation peacemaking program, a victim assistance program. Um, a lot of times asking questions and only looking narrowly at the legal issues, even with your, when you're successful in responding to the legal issues, won't address the underlying um, challenges and the underlying um, stresses or, or won't isn't helpful to um, what the, you know, the individual, the person is self-identifying as their biggest need. And so we try to have, we try to be a court that brought a lot of resources into the community and um, just the, the familiarity too, I would say with issues and uh, policies that are impacting our, um, the community. So right now, for example, you know, Red Hook was greatly impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Um, flooded, lost power systems, you know, were, were out. And here we are eight years later, and the construction has only just been underway, the federally funded uh, recovery construction. This, the construction has had really, really continually negative impacts uh, on the tenants. And our judge and court attorney and all staff have been in close communication with um, the property managers and um, everyone kind of the city, you know, the uh, politicians involved with, um, we can understand the impact of the issues as it comes up. And for example, when we saw a series of uh, leaks that were happening in six floor apartments, we could make the link that it was actually because of the roofing work that was being done. And rather than just issue tickets over and over again for uh, leaks in six floor apartments, communicate um, and we understand the local context in the way that I don't think uh, downtown centralized judges would understand. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Vivian, Thank for you. sharing with us this wonderful, um, the wonderful work that's being done there. Um, and I think um, we'll, we've got some, a couple of questions, but we're going to move on and um, talk to Jose for a minute here. And then um, we'll be coming back. So please, if you have questions, throw them up in the Q&A and we'll come back and ask all of our uh, panelists the follow-up questions. So we are watching those. Um, so our next, um, our next panelist is um, my friend and colleague Jose Padilla from California Rural Legal Assistance. Um, and Jose, you know, you have been doing this work at a legal aid organization for a very long time. And, you know, I've always been really inspired by your organization's dedicated to dedication to client and community um, centered approaches to legal aid. And I really think you have you've been doing this really well for a really long time. Um, and you, uh, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about CLA, CRLA is that you're a consistent voice about the need to share power with our client communities and come up with really innovative ways of shaping that work. So can you just, for those, uh, those folks who aren't familiar with CRLA, can you just tell us how you see it as unique as a legal aid organization and how you view the roles of lawyers there and how you work to employ, empower um, your client and community voices within the legal system and your organization. Well, thank you very much, Nicole, for the opportunity to share uh, some of the experiences we've had. I've been a legal aid lawyer for 42 years, um, and I, uh, all with one organization, CRLA, and that's because I was born and raised in rural California on the border. My grandparents were both sides of the family farm workers. My father was a farm worker before he be went to World War II. And so that inspired me to give my legal services uh, to the rural poor. Uh, and right out of Berkeley Law School, I went out and I ran, I was a field lawyer, and then I ran an office, and then six years into it, they made me state director, so here I am. 
CRLA is, is, a, is a large organization. We're a $17 million nonprofit. Uh, we're a huge board of directors, 45, um, because we're statewide. Um, we, we, among, um, um, among those 45 board members, we have a third of them who are farm workers. Um, and anyway, uh, we, we have a 70 uh, lawyer firm. Uh, we were set up as a corporate law firm for the rural poor. Uh, and so in our, when you look at our advocates, uh, we have 105 advocates, uh, 70 lawyers, and 35 community workers. A community worker is not a paralegal necessarily. They're community legal educators. They're not organizers because uh, when Jim Sandman and the, in the LSC, they don't let us organize in, in legal aid. And so my folk are just educators. And I'll talk a little bit about what we do there. Uh, but uh, we work, we came out of the war on poverty um, and uh, we're spread out through rural California. It's one thing for me to hear people say, well, we work in Brooklyn and, you know, I, my southernmost office is 12 hours from my northernmost office. I mean, we, we're 600 miles from south to north um, and it's just one of those ge geographic things we have to manage as we serve the rural poor. We were founded by legal aid, by attorneys and farm worker organizers. Those who know the history of farm labor in California, you know who Cesar Chavez is, you know who Larry Etlion, Dolores Huerta, Larry Etlion, they organized, they were part of the board of directors of CRLA and that's why we uh, have always had labor as a priority because we were, we were, formed, we were founded by um, farm, farm labor organizers among the, the, uh, the, the founding board. Um, that led us to, to handle early on big labor cases um, and, and uh, I wear this t-shirt uh, right here uh, that shows a farm worker, short hoe. Uh, the Carmona case, uh, we eliminated the use of, of, of the short hoe in farm labor because it broke farm workers' backs, including the back of, farm, of Cesar Chavez. That's why he always had a, a lifelong back in, in, uh, injury uh, that he had to deal, deal with. We're unique because, um, uh, I guess I'll just talk about firsts. Um, um, you know, we, about a, 15%, 20% of our cases are farm worker cases, but our philosophy is that farm worker or other rural poor deserve the same high quality of service that the wealthy deserve. That's what we were founded on and that's what we believe in. And so it's one thing for us to do individual cases like housing evictions and we do those. We do public benefits, people with unemployment, welfare, we do those. But then we do systemic change because corporate law firms do systemic change for their wealthy clients. And examples, uh, those of you who, who may know immigration, um, you know, we, we in the mid 80s, we did the Immigration Reform and Control Act uh, federally. It's the only time that we actually did any national uh, work, uh, legislative work, and we amnestied more than almost two and a half million people were amnestied because of that. That was our work, um, um, working with uh, Los Angeles Congressman Howard Berman who, who wanted to push immigration reform and we were able to do that. That's systemic advocacy on behalf of the poorest of the poor. A lot of those who amnestied in those days were farm workers. Um, but even today, we, we, do, we, we do systemic litigation. Uh, in the last few years, last couple of years, we've done some huge cases on behalf of black communities and Latino communities in rural California, where the students are being disproportionately expelled and suspended by school districts. And we, we do that kind of work. Again, it's systemic. It changes the school system and how it treats the poor student. High quality lawyering, we were the first to do as an example of um, sexual harassment. You talk about Me Too movement. We were doing Me Too work 20, 20 years ago. Uh, our first case was uh, 20, uh, 20 some years ago, um, an Fado case. Uh, and we brought in $1.8 million for sexually harassed women in, 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 in an ag company in the Central Valley. I'm sorry, in the coastal uh, area of Salinas. In the last five years, systemic litigation, uh, we've done three huge sexual harassment cases. We were the first legal aid to do sexual harassment work. And in the last uh, five years, we've done three huge cases, 2.4 million in settlement. Again, representing farm worker women who are sexually uh, harassed by their bosses uh, in, in rural California. So that's, that's part of uh, some of the uh, uh, sort of the, the systemic work that we do. And that's what makes us different than other legal aids. But we're also unique because we focus on, on certain rural communities that other people don't see. I've always said, we've always said that among the poor, there are people who are more oppressed, poorer. And so, for example, in, in rural California, there are, among the farm workers, indigenous farm workers. They don't speak Spanish. They come from, Latin, they come from countries in Latin America, in Mexico, speaking indigenous languages. 
uh, Mixteco, uh, they speak Triqui. Uh, and so how do you reach that worker? They're in agriculture, they're in our fields, they're in our areas. We have part of our paralegal force, we have five indigenous speaking uh, people coming from those communities. They were workers and then they, we hire them and they come in speak because they've got the trust of those communities. And so indigenous farm workers suffer differently. I already said farm worker women su suffer differently. We have a program that, that serves rural LGBTQ folk because they suffer discrimination differently in rural California. And so those are examples of some of the things that, 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 that we do in communities that we serve that are different than other legal aids. The role of lawyers in our organization is people were talking, uh, staff lawyers, we advise and counsel, we do the individual housing, the eviction cases, the labor and employment, unpaid wages for workers, we do that. My, my attorneys are, are legal aid office directors. You know, I got 17 offices. They manage the office, but they carry caseloads. Again, doing the systemic work and individual cases in, in California. They lead my task forces. I got a labor task force that looks at systemic issues big throughout the state of California. To, I have an education task force. We have a housing task force. Those are led by lawyers, but they're made up of lawyers and community worker paralegals. Um, and uh, again, my, my largest programs come from legal, legal services. The LSC funds me, maybe gives me seven million a year uh, to, do, to, do, to do my basic, basic services to the, the all rural poor and the farm worker poor. Uh, so how do we empower, empower clients in my last maybe two minutes that I have, I think. Um, look, in, in, ter in terms of getting your client voice heard, you have to start at the top. And I say that because you start at the board level. Like I told you before, I have a third of my, my board, 27 lawyers on my board, among them 20 farm workers. They don't speak English, most of them. So you have to have tr simultaneous translation in the board meetings. You go to one of my board meetings, they're being translated simultaneously throughout the three hour board meeting. We have leadership development as a priority at CRLA. A couple of years ago, the board said, we need to have leadership development. These were the farm workers talking. And they said that we wanted to have a leadership training retreat and we trained them to be their own voices out in those communities as they worked alongside CRLA. Um, your local structure uh, has to be aligned. Uh, we have local community advisory committees in every one of our offices, majority clients who tell our directors what the needs are in, in those communities. And also language is a big issue, not only at the board level, at the CRLA statewide level, but also in the in the, in the individual offices. And we have something called a Language Justice Institute within CRLA where we look at language justice as a critical issue. My language justice program trains translators in rural California to, to translate um, so that some of these community translators can translate for people before, before hospitals as examples at the school boards, et cetera. Um, and so barriers, uh, Mr. Sam, I'm not going to like this. Uh, uh, some of the barriers are the LSC regulations themselves. You know, again, uh, the way it's set up, only a third of the board can be a, a, a client voice, and, that's, and we work within that. We cannot organize, so we don't organize, but we train community leaders to be on our boards, and then we train them to go out into the communities and organize in their own, if, they, if that's what they see as a need, we educate them on the rights we educate them about the issues impacting their lives, and then they organize on their own. The other big, big, big barrier, undocumented. One third of California agriculture, I mean, one half of California agriculture is undocumented. Half of the worker that walks in that is either, uh, hasn't been paid wages and, and haven't been, uh, uh, have other issues, we can't serve them. So we have to have a very robust pro bono program referral program to get them services out in rural spaces. But that regulation is very, very difficult for us to work through, but we have to. We have to in order to serve those rural poor. Um, anyway, uh, polit the other final thing I was gonna say, another barrier is political lawyering. You know, when you take on big systemic cases, you're going to angry some very powerful people. Um, Jan Mr. Sandman knows um, a few years back, we, 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 we took on the dairy industry. We were winning huge cases, 100,000 wage theft, we're to a quarter of a million, half a million. The dairy came after us. I'm the only legal aid lawyer in, in the history of legal aid. They have to testify in front of Congress because of the dairy industry forcing us because of our labor, uh, labor advocacy. And so anyway, those are some of the barriers to, uh, to, uh, to legal services. And, um, uh, and, and it, 
an example of what you might want to do, I guess, uh, um, to all of you, if you're, if you're going to involve these very isolated communities, involve yourselves with that, you should have a robust uh, um, outreach program. Um, we have 70 lawyers and we have 35 outreach workers within CRLA. And I always say that we can, whenever we cut back, we cannot be cutting back the paralegals. We cut back the same, the lawyers cut back, are cut back when we go through major reductions in force, as do the community workers. And they suffer equally when we reduce. I always tell people that when CRLA goes out of business and we close our last office, I'll guarantee you that a lawyer will turn off the light, but the employee that worked, that walked out before the lawyer was an outreach worker. CRLA can never, ever serve these out isolated communities, like I mentioned, without uh, having a robust outreach community education program. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for that, Jose. I think there's some really great information in there both. I love um, the idea of, you know, having an enormous board and that also has so many um, client representatives and that they're directing the information that's coming or directing the work of your organization. I also know that um, for your previous conversation, you had some really great examples of ways that you were, um, that your organization under, comes to understand what problems your communities are facing. So I appreciate all of those things and also, you know, your examples of the barriers that are attendant to legal aid work as well. Okay, so we're getting some questions in the chat. So I want to turn over and start answering, um, ask our panelists to answer some of those questions and also encourage you all to um, put some questions either in the Q&A or the chat. And I think um, Liz, Liz Keith is gonna help me out here um, with questions. So uh, Liz, are you, are you here? I am. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Nicole and all for that wonderful discussion. And um, I think we'll start with a question from Paul uh, in the Q&A box. And Paul mentions that Jim's three points at the end of his remarks sum up the problem and solutions incredibly well. Um, since we work with vulnerable communities uh, and there are multiple dimensions of vulnerability and poverty, Paul asks, should we not also be better coordinating with non-legal assistance to ensure all measures of vulnerability, for example, drug treatment, mental health services, access to health care um, are included? And um, so I think I will um, uh, let Jim uh, uh, take that first, and then perhaps we can open it um, to other, other panelists. My answer, Paul, is yes, absolutely. And it's happening, but we need more of it. Uh, the best examples are situations where legal aid lawyers are embedded in community service organizations. The easiest example is medical legal partnerships, where lawyers are embedded in public uh, health facilities and um, uh, the, the medical people are trained to identify the legal component of what might present as a medical problem. And in effect, they write a prescription for a lawyer. And the lawyer is physically present on the site. So the um, the, the registered nurse, the physician's assistant, or the doctor can say, go down the hall and talk to this lawyer. Uh, what that addresses is the great Rebecca Sandifer problem. It doesn't require to people, people to self-identify their, their problem as a legal problem. They just have a problem. That people don't spend a lot of time labeling their problems. They, no, nobody thinks that's helpful. It's, it's, um, it's, it, it, so it ends up functioning as sort of a functional equivalent of what they, uh, they call in the UK um, uh, community advice centers, I, I believe, uh, government funded centers that people can go to when they have problems. And the people at the center have the range of skills that are necessary to address all kinds of pro uh, problems and know how to do the cross referrals to get people uh, to the right help regardless of what the, the person first said when they came in the door. So the, the medical legal partnership model has been uh, uh, followed with social services, with, uh, with the faith community. Where do people go for help? That, that's the question that you should ask and then uh, follow up by saying, and how can lawyers be in the middle of that? Great, wonderful. Is there anything, Nicole, uh, you'd like to add to that or others on the panel? 
I would say I'm a big fan of, of medical legal partnerships. That's one thing that Alaska uh, Legal Services, we've been building out a network of medical legal partnerships within the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and tribally operated healthcare system. And the benefits of doing that are not only can we expand our reach, we are also able to partner with people who are not law trained, but are uh, lived experience within very remote indigenous communities and are able then to, um, to again, what I give is what I think of as a legal inoculation, right? So that we are providing information about what the law is um, and how one might go about enforcing it in very remote areas. And, and uh, you know, those, those, um, that partnership has been very powerful for us. And so I am very much appreciative of it. One of the things I was mentioned oh. was the, the medical, I mean, the access to healthcare uh, as a critical legal need out in, out in, 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 the, in, the, in our, in our poor communities. It is, it is also very, very, uh, an unmet need in, in California, in rural California. Um, and so, and so we have one of our priorities is called rural health disparities. And so we, again, same thing, we, 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 uh, we work, uh, with, um, with health, pro health providers to try to make sure that, 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 that they have access, that our, our clients have access to, to the, to the healthcare system. But at the same time, we also have a medical legal partnership and we want to replicate it in the area where we're working that project. Again, it's very, very focused, um, working with pharma uh, families, especially women, uh, but we're working with, 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 with the health clinics in these rural spaces. Uh, in the past, in our history, we have created the health clinics that now are serving those communities. And so as lawyers, when you, you, know, you can form a nonprofit, you, you can, in some of these areas, you, can, you could form these, these health clinics, but right now we're working with them and we wanna replicate that, that model um, in, in order to, uh, to, to try to um, expand the access to health services. Uh, I guess that's the only, um, just saying that medical legal partnership is a great, great, great model and we're trying to figure out how to expand it. And, um, I'm exploring trying to figure out how we can do a medical legal partnership with, veter with vet veteran organizations because veterans are another, rural veterans are another community that has a lot of unmet needs and nobody in California is really focused in rural veteran needs. Um, um, and so, but I'll cut it off there. I was just going to add in just a small point, which is really, well, it's not really a small point, actually, <laughs> it's a big point, um, which is just this question of, you know, when you're looking at, at vulnerabilities and needs um, to expand to sort of being able to think about collective ways of meeting needs, right, as opposed to individualized solutions. Um, and so, you know, kind of a lot of our more traditional go-tos have focused on, you know, here's X other professional who's not a lawyer that I can refer you to or connect you with, uh, whether that's a medical professional or a social worker or some person who has, you know, fancy letters after their name. Um, but, you know, to be able to kind of, you know, expand our horizons a bit to realise that, 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 you know, over the course of history, a lot of problems have been solved by people coming together collectively and being able to advance solutions in different ways and, and building that into how we do legal services work, I think, is, is really important. Um, and I think it's something we've just struggled with um, because, you know, because a lot of folks who, are, who, who do this work actually aren't familiar, honestly, with, with a lot of that history and with a lot of the um, things that are available to people in terms of community organizing and solidarity work and mutual aid and, you know, all of those different things. And, and so I do think for us, like as a, as a profession, you know, it can, um, sometimes we can, we, you know, we can afford to sort of expand our horizons a little bit too. Absolutely. Is, Wonderful. Uh, could I just add one thing to about Paul's suggestion? One of the best ways uh, to accomplish what he's talking about is for service providers, all kinds of service providers serving the community to co-locate together in the community so that they're literally under one roof. That can really help the, the cross referrals and the, uh, the, sh the sharing of information uh, um, it can be really that there's a facility in Los Angeles uh, that does that. We need more of that kind of thing instead of segregating the, the services in the way we tend to now. Well, Jim, actually, that's kind of interesting uh, because out of our 17 offices, we own like six of those buildings. But we have, I have always purchased buildings with two faces. And one face is the legal aid. And in the other face, you have services that complement what you do. 
And so you have nonprofits in that other space doing some of them that we can't do. I've had immigration in, in uh, one of the problems in, in rural California is that the, the Latino community in particular, the, the, the immigrant community is being abused by a system that's Latin American. It's uh, the notario system uh, where notarios become immigration practitioners and people go there and they get scammed. Uh, but so, so one of the things that I've had in some of my offices is an immigration practitioner who the community trusts, who we know we can refer to that, to that business. They're, I mean, it's an immigration lawyer as a business but the idea is to have complementary services there so you're able to meet the need that you cannot meet uh, as, as a legal aid. And so um, I, I totally agree with that, that idea of co-locating and bringing in other, other services right next to yours. But we do, we do it in, in conjunction with the purchases of our buildings. Like anyway, we intentionally do that. And, and bring, we've got ho homeless advocates in, in, in some of our offices doing that kind of work as another example. Um, okay. Great. Mm. Building on that really quickly, just because that is also our model, the co-location of services. And we have under one roof, the, you know, a mental health clinic, a victim assistance clinic, all um, uh, community mediation services, all free. Um, and just that, that warm handoff, if you will, also to not create that barrier of a referral. Um, also being able to really respond to concrete needs in the moment has been really helpful um, and provide emotional support through the housing process because um, you know even though we work in this system all day long you know to the individuals we work with even the process of of coming to court is is re-traumatizing um, the prospect of of facing an eviction or legal action um, taps into such uh, deep um, vicarious trauma and so we've we, we see that as, as essential to our, our housing work and our legal adjacent work. Um, and to Marika's point also though, we don't wanna just be a, a self perpetuating um, system, you know, like our goal is to put ourselves out of business. And, you know, we do our own advocacy and we work with other uh, organizing groups when there are issues that are, have collective um, impact, whether it's prevalence of of you know mold and lead pain and public um, health issues, we find those partners to be able to uh, drive the systemic change. There was a, a public health evaluation in Red Hook, a health needs assessment focused on public health, where the number one need was housing and housing conditions and housing insecurity. And conversely, we see in our housing work that the number one issue underlying, um, you know, uh, rent delinquency or um, other issues leading to holdover matters is often um, mental health. Great. Well, Viviana, um, there's another question from Candice in the Q&A box uh, that I think um, will go to you to, to respond to next. Um, she asked how the, the Red Hook uh, Community Justice Center came to fruition and are there steps a community member might take to advocate for um, a similar program or um, court that you would suggest? Definitely. Um, the organizing and planning uh, for our community court came in the 90s um, and at the time it was extremely counter to all of the criminal justice policies that were driving incarceration and uh, punitive responses in our system. And it was a collaborative effort um, with the state court system, um, but we were brought in to kind of help with the community planning side. And I'm glad that we had the forethought back then, I wasn't around in the mid nineties, but the first uh, program that we started to assess community needs, if you will, and see whether um, this new model of justice could work was actually our AmeriCorps program. And this was the year that AmeriCorps was created, 1995. And rather than having a model that hired um, young, bright people and brought them into communities of need, our model was, um, as Marika mentioned, the recognition of those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And it was a community hiring, community empowerment model where uh, we had 50 AmeriCorps members every year leading um, the, the planning efforts and identifying the needs that were um, most pressing, pressing and the underlying issues within this community that is a segregated public housing community um, and has been subject to really all of the you know, public disinvestment that you know, leads to this concentration of poverty. It was originally conceived to be a criminal court 
Um, but what came out of that community planning, community needs assessment process was how inextricable housing and those civil uh, legal needs were. And so from there it was really uh, conceived to be a multi-jurisdictional court. And how can you start the process of bringing a community court in your jurisdiction? There's many models of community courts, but a lot of the concepts that you know, you could say, people often say rhetoric has the Cadillac version um, because we have our own building, we have all those co-located services. A lot of them are you know, under our own nonprofit, but every community um, can find a space. And there are models across the country of community courts um, holding offsite hearings in libraries, in community centers, um, in you know, uh, accessible spaces and bringing uh, the judge and the lawyers into those spaces for specialized dockets. And then during those times also co-locating a lot of um, public health, you know, mental health, substance abuse, housing advocates into those spaces. And in that just providing, um, you know, more home humane responses that, you know, really address the underlying issues um, beyond the legal case in front. So uh, our website has a lot more examples of what community courts can look like. They're really, um, is very broad and really is driven by those underlying concepts. Great, thank you. Um, so we also have a question from, from Doug for the group who is wondering, is anyone working on innovative approaches to disrupt the school to prison pipeline by reaching out to families and students facing disciplinary action um, as a result of behaviors that manifest underlying disabilities? So uh, is there anyone on the, on the panel that would like to speak to that or um, share examples of that? Uh, yeah, I can, I can share an example. Uh, we have a program at CRLA called um, the School to Nowhere program. And you all know, those, those of you who work in legal aid, you know that when you get students, especially students of color that are disproportionately expelled in, in rural schools in California, they end up in the juvenile justice system. And all of a sudden, the legal aid washes their hands and says, I lost that case. They're in the juvenile justice system. Can't do anything about it. We decided to jump into that space and form this program where we, in some of our counties, we work with the Superior Court judge who is in charge of the Juvenile Justice Court and to try to educate the judges about, for example, special education, which impacts a lot of these students. These students, when they get done with whatever the juvenile justice system gives them to do, the school districts won't take them back. And so what we have to do is we have to go back and actually go after the school boards in trying to get them to accept the students back when you're working in that juvenile justice space. And so for us, we look at in California, there's something like 32 state prisons. Talking about a, 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 the, the feeding system into, the, into, the, into, the, into that prison system, it's a failure of the schools to educate the, 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 the students of color. And so, and so we try to get into that space, working with ju juvenile justice defenders to try to, to try to intervene and try to help in that way. Um, but again, it's a, it's a pretty unusual, I think, for legal aids to do that because most of us don't, that's supposed to be for the, for the public defender system. And we decided to at least in, in, in trying to address the issue of disproportionate, uh, or disproportional suspension and expulsion of black students, um, uh, and Latino students. We just sued a big school district three years ago, Kern Unified, for that same reason. And we were able to get, gain a huge settlement and, and brought in an expert to develop program to work with the teachers, educating teachers about the, the, the issues we, with students who are having problems in schools like that. Um, trying to figure out how to work with mental health services, um, special ed students, uh, et, et, et cetera. But again, it, it's, uh, that's, that's, we, we figured that if we can disrupt the feeding system, the juvenile justice system that then feeds the students uh, or the juvenile justice offenders into the regular prison system, if we can stop it there, then that's a role for us to play in, in that. We've done that through the, uh, the Rural Education Equity Program. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, well, we have a few other questions in the Q&A, but um, I think in the interest of time, we're going to turn it back to Nicole to uh, close out with a final question for all of the panelists. If we didn't get to your question today, please um, bring that to discussions later this week or into the, the Slack space. We would love to keep this uh, discussion going. 
Right. So with our final question, first off, I want to thank all of you for, for joining us today. And I wanted to just close out, um, and maybe Marika, we could start with you. Um, yes, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. Um, it, could you give us like one concrete example of something that if you had your wish, um, legal aid lawyer, lawyers or legal aid providers uh, could do differently that would make the legal system more inclusive of the voices of those who are most impacted? And if we did that, what would be different than what we are now? Um, I mean, I think, you know, I would say one critical piece that I think is, is oftentimes lacking in legal services organisations is um, an understanding that the law is but one of many political systems um, that are impacting folks. And uh, you know, as opposed to the sort of fetishization of the law and us as lawyers that we tend to engage in, but understanding that we are part of a political system um, that impacts people and, and acting accordingly. Um, engaging with that system, understanding that we are political actors, that we are um, playing a certain role in that system and that we can shift how we, the role that we play. And whether that's the bigger things like um, being so much less wed to the idea of winning cases as opposed to the idea of fighting for the right thing, um, whether it's accessing, you know, questioning and interrogating the kind of privileged spaces that we access even physically in courtrooms to the exclusion of our clients, whether it's pushing back on things like judges who say, just want to hear from counsel right now and you leave your client behind sitting there by themselves and, and you know, don't think twice. You know, all of these myriad sort of little ways that we have propped up and continue to perpetuate a system that is so grossly unequal and really um, is, is the foundation foundation for so much structural inequality, um, I think would be, you know, a strong step in the right direction. And to, to understand that, you have to be, ed, you know, educating yourself on the institutions and also on the history. And, and, and that includes the history of legal services organisations and the role that we have historically played, um, both in terms of providing massive amounts of support and aid to folks, but also in terms of propping up unjust systems um, and giving veils of legitimacy to systems that are actually oppressive. Excellent. Thank you, Marika. Those are wonderful party or just inspiring partying words. So um, I will turn next to, let's go to uh, Viviana. Same question. There was so much great in what you said, Marika, so much. Um, I would say two things quickly. And sorry, my dog's barking in the background. Can you hear it? <laughs> okay. I'm Keep sorry. Going. Okay. Um, he, I would say one is is listening, um, really listening. Um, and as the non-lawyer in the group also, uh, really making sure that uh, your, your clients understand um, and, um, and just the concepts that we really try to hold on to with, with procedural justice of giving, um, a lot of times lawyers are the ones who do the talking and the ones who do the decision making, but wherever possible to understand the underlying issues and the impact, the collateral consequences that this experience has had and, um, and respond to that. And then secondly, I would also say, yes, never lose sight of the systemic um, inequalities and institutions of white supremacy that have led to this um, and use your power as lawyers. I think every legal services organization should also have some focus on systemic advocacy or impact litigation or class action lawsuits um, to be able to uh, to, to, to change the system. We regularly see every day conditions that we believe violate the Fair Housing Act, the Equal Protection Clause, um, are not in compliance with New York City Charter, and uh, lawyers should use the specialized knowledge that they have to, to uh, uh, dismantle those policies. Great, well, Jose, um, what's one thing you would change about legal aid organizations? Um. Well, what I was going to say was actually, I'm not sure exactly how related this is, but in terms of one big change, um, the LSC regulations require us to, to prioritize uh, the services that we give. And most legal aids that I know, you know they, they choose priorities like these, the, you know, like uh, housing is your priority. And then you're going to provide more, then, then you choose uh, public benefits as a priority. But if you're listening, as it was just said, you might find that, that 
that the client community may look at it differently. Our client community in the last priority setting conf conferences, and we, we go statewide, we, we have 100 people show up at a retreat three days in the middle of a Silomar out there on the, on, 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 on the Santa Cruz coast or something. And we stop and we question ourselves about that. And the client representation, they wanted leadership development. We have a priority called leadership development. It's very different than we're talking about education, housing, labor. It's not a substantive area. Why? Because they said, we don't want the lawyers talking for us. Teach us to be leaders so we can be our voice in front of the city councils, in front of the boards of supervisors. Why can't you do that for us? And that's exactly what we did. And, and we actually went up in the re retreat center in the Central Valley, up in the mountains, in the Sierra Mountains, and we actually did a three-day training over the weekend of clients, must have been about 40 to 50 of them, so they could go back into the communities and be their own voice. And so the idea of leadership development as a priority, which seems like, wait a minute, it's not a substantive priority. Well, that's right, because you're listening to the client voices on your board and they're saying, how about us? How about, how, why can't, why do you have to talk for me all the time? And then that's where we ended up with this leadership development as a priority, but it, because we started listening and we were a little humble and saying, you know what, they're right. We, we, we need to resource it. It wasn't cheap, something like $100,000 to, to bring folk together, but you know what, you have to invest in that voice. Anyway, out. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jose. And Jim, I'm going to uh, throw it to you to, uh, uh, I guess, for parting words um, from you about what would you change? My, I, it's hard for me to identify a particular thing. Uh, my advice is to think big. You can't think too big. Uh, I, as I said at the outset, we need solutions that are commensurate with the magnitude and the urgency of the problem. This isn't something we can take decades to do. Now, now, now is the time. So I think we need to think about this systemically, big picture, um, not around the edges. And I've heard so many great suggestions this afternoon from the panelists about how to do that. Bravo to you. Thank you all. Um, thank you for that, Jim, and, and inspiring us as, as we walk away um, to all of our panelists. And I think, um, it, you know, I'll just close out with what my thoughts are. Um, earlier this week, I was um, talking with somebody who will have the good fortune, um, a colleague that I work with in Alaska, uh, Liz Lacuane Medicine Crow, and she'll be on a panel later this week about the importance and the essentiality of centering our work around our clients' voices and with our clients in that. And I asked her at, at some point, I said, well, what do we miss when we don't include our clients in our work? And she said, justice itself. And so if I had one thing that I would, um, would want to say about what we could change about the work that we do is that uh, legal aid, that legal aid that we would understand that we missed justice when we are not doing the work in community with our, our clients and our client community. So, thank you all for joining us. Great. Well, thank you so much to Jim and all of our panelists for this amazing discussion and Nicole for designing and moderating this fantastic session and to all of you for Thank gathering you, with us today uh, and sharing your own perspectives and experiences. Tomorrow we will be uh, deepening this discussion about advancing models that are less lawyer forward with two sessions focusing on democratizing access to the law, uh, focusing on regular regulatory reform and roles beyond lawyers. And we will be kicking off with a keynote by Dr. Rebecca Sanderfer at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, Pacific. So um, thank you again, uh, everyone for joining us today for this incredible discussion. And we'll look forward to uh, uh, rejoining together here tomorrow morning.